and the topic. Good, that's a good, good split. Jeff, will you take it away? Is this on now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, we put some books out there uh, on the table so you can go and look at them uh, afterwards if you like. Um, I'm not set up for retail sales, but I just buy them from Amazon. So if you want to reimburse me, then that's great. Um, if you want to take one away, or or you can just go to go to Amazon and buy them. So um, I teach now at the University of San Francisco. Um, it was a challenge getting down here from San Francisco. I teach until 4:30. And I had to be here at 5.30 for the dinner, and getting out of San Francisco at that time is not, not so easy. Um, so Kate and I wrote this book uh, starting about, oh, I'd say, what, was it 2013 that we started working on it? 2014, something like that? Yeah. Um, and um, I, we came here just before we started working on the book and gave a talk about designing websites for an aging population. How many of you were at that talk? One, two people. Okay, that's good. Uh, some, of this, some of this might be repeated, um, but since most of you weren't here, uh, uh, we've also written a book since then, this book that uh, Nancy showed you. And so this will uh, uh, update a lot of that material and also we're now the book is not just about designing websites, it's about designing digital technology of all types for an aging population. So I guess what I'll start with is why do we need to do this? Why do we, do we need to design uh, age-friendly technology? And this is, this is, this is why. Um, if you look at the population of the Earth, uh, these countries are the ones with the top, these are the top 10 countries with uh, po populations over, um, uh, over 50. And as you can see, China, which is the most populous country in the world, uh, has almost 400 million people over the age of 50. India is the next with almost 250 million. The United States is third with over 100 million and Japan, Russian Federation, et cetera. Um, but the interesting thing is that all these graphs are growing every day as more and more people pass the 50-year-old threshold. So in 2015, uh, now these, the um, United Nations splits these estimates uh, by whether they're talking about the developed world or the undeveloped world or the less developed world. And um, because in the developing world, there is a much uh, higher population growth. That is, there's a, there's, there's a lot of kids. Uh, and in the more developed regions of the world, uh, the population of, adult, of older adults is hi higher percentage. So, so basically, in 2015, was almost 40% in the de developed regions of the world. And now, uh, to in 2025, it's projected to be over 40% and growing into 2035. Uh, in the developing regions of the world, it's not quite, it wasn't quite at uh, 20% in 2015, but it's, it's also growing. And, and actually, that's expected to accelerate as the developing world um, gains gains better life expectancy and that sort of thing. So um, you might have heard that, pe you might have heard people say, well, older people don't use technology. Uh, well, it's not true. Uh, if you look at different age groups, so 65 plus, 50 to 64, 30 to 49, 80 to 29, uh, this is a, done by Pew Internet, a, a survey organization. So um, what it shows is that the young people, 18 to 29, are 
uh, online the most, and it's increasing, but notice it's flattening. It's flattening out. Um, then the next age group, 30 to 49, also increasing, 50 to 64, increasing. The fastest growing group is 65 plus. Now, there are two reasons for that, obviously. One reason is that more and more people who are in this age group move into this one when they turn 65. Uh, and the other is that um, it's becoming less and less uh, possible to avoid using technology. Um, so uh, what this shows is um, people in uh, wh whose birth generations, so in the United States we refer to people by their birth generation so there's millennials, 18 to 34, Gen X, 35 to 50, uh, young boomers, 55 to 51 to 59, older boomers. So this is, this is how old these people are now. And silent generation is basically this is our parents, my parents. Um, and uh, so this is their percentages of tech adoption. And you can see that 60% of the people, even in this oldest bra bracket, age bracket, are, have adopted some sort of technology. So, so even, even that percentage, even though it's lower than the others, that's nothing to sneeze at. That's nothing to ignore. If you're a company that makes technology, you don't want to ignore that, um, that large a, num a number of people. If we break it down by device ownership and the kind of devices people are using and age group, so what we see is, and again, oh, this is the source here is uh, Anderson 2015. Uh, the reference for this is in, a, is in our book. Um, if you break it down by that, that uh, by category of uh, device, what we see is that tablets are, I mean, it's, it's not exactly equal but there's not that big, much of a big age, range, age difference. Uh, people are using tablets about the same. Uh, maybe the oldest people are using tablets less, uh, um, but it's significantly the youngest people are not using tablets more than uh, their parents, essentially. Um, now, when you look at cell phones, Again, that's another category where there's not so much of an age difference uh, between different uh, age groups uh, in terms of how, they're, how much they use it. Uh, and computers and laptops, again, the differences are small. Where, where they are large is in smartphones. So um, for various reasons, the oldest people, people over 65, um, uh, have been not adopted smartphones in as much uh, numbers as their younger cohorts. Um, you can think of, you can probably think of reasons why that is. Uh, many people, for example, some of my, uh, well, first of all, I should say I'm in this category. <laughs> I have a smartphone. But uh, many people who are my age and older um, have flip phones because their relatives gave them a flip phone so that they could keep in touch with them. And they turn it off, put it aside. So you can't get in touch with them, which is frustrating. But anyway, that's, that's what's going on, a lot of that kind of thing. Um, but eventually, there won't be any flip phones anymore, and so they'll, they'll have smartphones, and this, so this, this will go up. So um, now the irony about this is that uh, the irony of sort of the stereotype of older adults not using technology is that technology actually can help older adults probably more than it can help most other people because um, it provides benefits that can benefit people who are mobility limited and um, uh, uh, you know, don't get around town as much as they used to. 
So here's, here's a quote, here's a, here are quotes from uh, various uh, users, some of, most of whom are old. A Mac laptop opened the world to me right here from my kitchen table, blah, blah, blah. So, um, so the computer was actually a good thing for that person. Uh, I can keep in touch with people all over the world. I feel so connected to so much of the world, art, music, nature, comedy, humanity. Uh, and technology helped me move 19 times in the past nine years, taking everything with me. I can't go back, I can't imagine to going back to life without a computer. These are quotes from older adults. Um, but the trouble is, the irony is that that benefit, that much of that potential benefit uh, is essentially wasted because much of the technology uh, is not well designed for that age group. So you get c comments like these. How can I make the font bigger? I can't see it. I wish they'd stop changing things for, for no reason. All the new technology is just so confusing. Who thought thin gray letters was a good idea? So much to remember. What happened to the menus? I don't know where to get help. Is this a website or an app? I don't know the difference. You hear people say, where did my cursor go? <laughs> Uh, I, I lose the cursor all the time, and I just have to kind of wiggle it around on my screen until I see it again. Um, I have been, at the University of San Francisco, I have been lecturing all day, and so, excuse me if I'm a little hoarse. A little hoarse is a pony, I think. Um, So the kind of usability issues that impact uh, older adults more than uh, younger ones is, are things like these, illegible text, passwords, lost objects, captchas, mysterious icons, what does that mean? Small targets, confusing navigation, not understanding where the focus is. We've, we've seen this a lot in some, of our, in some of our studies, not knowing where the focus is and therefore thinking, uh, Go, getting off track. Frequent updates and changes. I just got used to Facebook. Why did they change it? Uh, and the lack of tech support. I am tech support for most of my family. You probably are too. Um, Alan F. Newell, who is not the same Alan Newell who once was here at Xerox Park, uh, was he, Alan F. Newell was a is a researcher in, in, uh, in England. I think he's retired now. Um, and he, he worked on accessibility, especially for older adults. And he wrote, design for older adults and you design for almost everyone else, including these groups. So th these are people who aren't necessarily old, older, uh, but they have problems that overlap with the problems that older adults exhibit. So low vision or physical impairments, people with low literacy, little te technical experience, obsolete technical experience, second language learners, and certain people with certain cognitive impairments. And in addition, people who are um, people who are young and uh, not um, impaired can still have situational impairments. The word is situational impairment. So imagine you're on a bus and you're trying to, uh, the bus is bouncing along and you're trying to use your cell phone and text somebody, okay? Or imagine you're riding a horse while trying to use your cell phone. I, I know you all do that. I saw the horses out here on the street, a little just down the street from here, yeah. So that's how you all got here, right? Uh, while looking at your cell phone. Um, so basically what the problem is that those things shake. They bounce. And, and while they're doing that, you're trying to hit certain things with your, with your finger and uh, you might miss, okay? And so you might appreciate having larger targets to hit and things that, like that. But you might appreciate the same thing that older adults would appreciate. So what we're looking for when we're designing 
for older adults is helping coming up with solutions that help everyone so when people when curb cuts were put in and this is a curb cut that's three three uh, houses from my house um, when curb cuts were put in basically they were put in because they were mandated uh, by city laws or city ordinances because of accessibility concerns we need to be able to accommodate people with wheelchairs and let people with wheelchairs get around our city that's why they were put in but are most of the people who use curb cuts people in wheelchairs no not even by not even close and most of the people who use curb cuts are on skateboards they have are pushing shopping carts they're dragging roller bags they're pushing strollers all sorts of things people use curb cuts um, who aren't in wheelchairs so this is an enhancement that was put in for a, a particular purpose of helping people who are in wheelchairs but it helps everyone similarly uh, how many of you are familiar with the OXO brand of, of kitchenware okay some of you so correct Kate correct me if I get this wrong but the OXO brand was created when one person decided that his wife had trouble using a particular kind of potato peeler maybe it was a yeah okay and so he, he he didn't like the way the potato peeler worked because her hand she had arthritis okay so he redesigned the potato peeler and pretty much he would pretty soon he was designing them for all his friends and then he decided to create a brand of kitchenware and so there's all this ergonomic kitchenware now that comes out of this company that is very it's wildly popular okay because it's actually easy to use and it doesn't make your hand hurt after you've been peeling a potato I don't know if you've ever made an apple pie it's I'm the I'm the apple peeler in our house when it comes to making apple pies and let me tell you uh, I, I would really love a better grater uh, or better peeler so anyway so these things um, are were designed for a specific person handicapped person's need but it turns out that they're um, very good for everyone and so that's what we're looking for we're looking for not designs that say older people would like and younger people would hate that's not what we're looking for we're looking for designs things design principles and design ideas that would make things better for everyone including older people especially because of the demographics that I showed you earlier which show sort of show that th that is not a market to neglect okay so now we what we'll do we get to is the argument that I've heard from some places where people say well look this is a temporary problem people are old now they don't know how to use technology they're gonna die <laughs> and and then everyone will know how to use technology because everyone else grew up with it right but the problem is that argument is just wrong it's just it's wrong in, in, in many ways it's um, it's wrong because not every not all young adults are techno whizzes I mean I teach at USF the people in my classes were are 20 years old okay many of them don't know the difference between cell service and internet or Wi-Fi okay many okay many of them don't know what's what they're doing when they use their cell phone they don't know what's happening inside the phone one of the things we do at USF is we actually have a class where you can actually write apps for a cell phone using a visual programming system and kids are amazed because then they get to learn how how texts actually work okay so so uh, so not all young adults are techno whizzes the other thing though is that technology doesn't stand still it continues to develop and the technology that you th that what you call technology today won't be considered technology in 25 years it'll be considered old stuff just like we consider horses and buggies old stuff now even though when horses and buggies first appeared that was technology and people there were people then who didn't like horses and buggies because why would you you know get in this thing okay with wheels and 
be behind a horse that was going to poop all over you. Okay, so, so, um, so basically, the 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 the, the idea is that this that there is a notion of something called a technology generation, and people grow up in a particular technology generation, and they grow up, and and they, what happens is they have trouble with technology they didn't grow up with. So now let's explore this idea of technology generations because it has been sort of formalized um, in the literature. So we have these name generations. And these are the age bands in which th these people were born. So people, so this is, this is me. I'm in this generation. I was born between 1940-something and 1964, there, so, thereabouts. I won't tell you exactly when, <laughs> but I was born in, in this age band. So I'm a baby boomer. My parents were in this generation, the silent generation, born between um, 1930 or so and 1945, end of the war. Then their parents were the GI generation, uh, born actually back here somewhere and uh, uh, until through about 1920. And so then if, uh, you know, the, the people who were in my, the baby boomers kids are called Gen X, they're born in this age band. Millennials are their kids born in this band. And Gen Z, the people are being born now. These, these people are being born in this age band today, OK? So today's infants are here and toddlers. Uh, some of my students. No, just joking. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, no, my students are actually in this band. They're, they're toward the tail end of this band. But the thing that's important is not when they were born, not when the people were born, but when they were in their formative years, or the, the literature calls it the maturation years. And that's considered to be uh, between, I believe it's uh, 10 and 25. So there's a convention in the literature, and Karen, Kate and I just decided to follow that convention. So in the literature, basically, the maturation years are considered between the ages of 10 and 25. In those years, when you're between 10 and 25, that's when you're coming to grips with the world. You're learning about stuff around you. Before that, you were a little kid. You did whatever your parents said, or did you told your parents no. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, so you, you, uh, you uh, so in the age of 10 to 25, you're, you're learning about the world. You're basically coming of age. So GI generation, this is their coming of age band. Silent generation, this is theirs. Baby boomers, this is theirs. Notice they overlap. Okay. So, so then the next thing we would have to, to go to is what are called technology generations. When were certain technologies prevalent? Well, up until in, in this period from 1900, the turn of the century, until 1930-something, we had mechanical equipment. Everything was mechanical. Then we had electromechanical equipment in from 19, uh, just before the w World War II to about 1960, that was electromechanical. So uh, I, I remember the whole, the old Hoover vacuum cleaners that we had in our houses. So those were electromechanical. Um, uh, yeah, and then there's analog electric, electronic. So. Uh, you know, when I was in college, basically we all got these high-end stereo component systems. Those were those were analog electronic. Uh, then there's the personal computer and basic internet band. These are these are times when these technologies were sort of prevalent. Were really uh, sort of in the marketplace and in your face. In, if you open the newspaper, you would see stuff in, in uh, of this type. So then we then we had web and search and e-commerce coming on in the in the late 1990s, uh, and it hasn't ended yet. So that's why I put uh, those question marks there. And digital music took on came about 2002 or so, and uh, when I think uh, the all of these illegal systems were developed for getting and downloading I music, then. Apple kind of took it over with uh, the, with uh, the iPod and the the uh, 
the, um, their online music service. Then social and mobile started really in 2005, six, seven, thereabouts. And again, none of these have, have ended yet, so we don't know when, when they'll end. So let's now superimpose those coming of age years of the various generations and see which technologies they grew up with. So the GI generation, notice that they all kind of span more than one of these technology generations. So the GI generation, my parents' parents started growing up in the mechanical age and moved as they got older into the electromechanical age. But then they, by the time they reached the end of their maturation years was when analog electronic hit and that was completely you know, beyond the ken of these people. Okay, so these people would say, what, what is that you know, stereo system? So what I remember is going to visit my grandparents and seeing, instead of you know, this component stereo system I had, seeing this big wooden box here with a record changer in it playing 78s and going, oh, you know, grandma, why don't you get a real stereo system? Um, I considered that to be old technology and what I had to be modern technology, okay? So, so there you have the boomers who are spanning analog electronic and co personal computer and basic internet. And therefore, they're gonna be struggling with web search and e-commerce, digital music and social and mobile. You have Gen X, which grew up uh, with personal computers, started with personal computer and moved into uh, web search and e-commerce, but then they're gonna struggle with digital music and social and mobile, et cetera. So basically, what this is intended to show is that everyone gets stuck to a certain, you know, to varying degrees. I mean, some of us, some of us, because I teach this technology stuff in programming, I'm sort of keeping on that part of it. But for example, I have never used Tinder. I don't even know what it is. I don't know what, um, oh, I, ha I don't have a Twitter account. Okay, so, so um, I know what Twitter is though, unfortunately. All right, so, so, so those are, that's one reason why this, this problem will not disappear, is that um, people get stuck wherever they are and technology doesn't get stuck, it keeps going, okay? The other th thing that will happen is most of us will experience age-related changes. Um, those happen, th the important thing to say here is that Th those are highly variable. The age-related changes that people experience are highly variable and the variability grows as age band grows. So that's one of the troubles with studying uh, computer and technology use among older adults is the higher the age band you look at, the more variance there is. And it makes it hard to actually study and get you know, significant results and that sort of thing. So part of what our book talks about is what are some of the age-related changes that occur and what are the guidelines that we propose to um, or that we get from the research, from reading a lot of research, uh, for alleviating the, the problems that people have because of these age-related changes. So now that's what I'm going go to go through for sort of the rest of this. Um, unless there are any questions right now. Any questions at this point about the technology generations or anything like that? I've sort of gotten into the habit of stopping and asking if there are any questions because I teach now and so. Uh, but before I actually go into all these age related changes which can be depressing, um, especially when you've reached the age that I've reached. Um, let's talk about some good things about aging. Uh, so, um, 
what, one thing that researchers distinguish between, cognitive, cognitive science researchers distinguish between what's called crystallized and fluid intelligence. So fluid intelligence is, is sort of um, ability to solve problems that you haven't ever encountered before. And um, that's, that's sort of a, an easy and non-technical way to say it. But basically, you can, there, IQ tests are full of tests of fluid intelligence. Crystallized intelligence is more or less knowledge. It's knowledge. And older people actually have more of that, believe it or not, than younger people do because they've been around longer and they've had a chance to accumulate it. So they have bigger vocabularies. That's part of the, the uh, higher crystallized knowledge or crystallized intelligence and um, more real world experience to draw from. And this, this manifests itself, by the way, in search. For example, if you put older and younger adults in a search task, what you find is that it, it depends on whether it's a well-defined or an ill-defined search task, task. If it's a well-defined search task, younger people do better. Older people take longer. If it's an ill-defined search task, older people do better because they have more world knowledge to draw on to help them uh, recover from, oh, that wasn't what I wanted. Now, here, here, let me put in some new words, okay? Um, less tendency to worry, higher rates of life satisfaction, senior discounts, that's a great thing. Uh, and uh, good things about aging, well, it's better than the alternative, <laughs> not aging. So, okay, so now, we'll talk about the age-related changes. Um, I don't need to read you this list, but basically your eyes get worse. Your, your eyesight gets worse in various ways. Um, and we'll go, with, we'll go through some of these uh, and show you some examples. Um, so here's the Covered California site. This is where you go to get Obamacare in California. Um, and it's, this is viewed through normal vision. One of the nice things is on the web now, there are simulators. And so you can take your website or your image or whatever it is you wanna test and run it through the simulator and it'll tell you what it looks like with someone with presbyopia, what it looks like with someone with uh, uh, you know, red, green color blindness, what it looks like for someone who has macular degeneration. So those are quite useful. You can just Google it, Google uh, vision deficiency simulators or something like that. So uh, normal vision, presbyopia, it's blurred. So if, you, if, if I had to read that and I'd forgotten these, if I'd forgotten these, then I would be in trouble, okay? Uh, lens yellowing, so over, over a period of a long lifetime, uh, sunlight, uh, ultraviolet light, uh, turns your cornea and lens red, or yellow, I'm sorry, yellow. And um, also, uh, yeah, so, so basically what happens is things begin to take on a yellowish tint, and therefore if there's stuff on your site, on your website or in your app or on, on your device in which yellow has meaning, it will be harder to discern. Uh, it also, a tint, tint of yellow turns the difference between blue and green, it makes it less. Um, glare sensitivity, uh, that comes apart because, about because of cataracts, which I had until I had a cataract operation, uh, and also scratching of the lens and cornea. Okay. And so I have, I have friends my age who do not like to drive at night because the oncoming headlights cause too much glare and they can't um, see very well. So, so basically, these are problems that some older adults will have, um, but even non-older adults. So if you imagine you're trying to use your iPad and you're out by the pool, the swimming pool, you're gonna, you might ha have this problem, okay? Uh, or, uh, you know, other, other problems, some of these. Many, many people who, uh, even when I was young, I had, um, 
I had actually nearsightedness when I was young. Now I have farsightedness. Uh, and another thing that occurs is um, uh, because of, because of va various changes in your retina and in your uh, lens and cornea, uh, less light gets through. The average 60-year-old um, needs three times as much light as a 20-year-old to perceive the same brightness, three times. Okay, So a page that looks like this to a 20-year-old web designer might look like this to a senior. There are also visual cognitive deficits. So uh, people ha have more difficulty reading moving text, um, less likely to, de to detect small, subtle screen elements. I'll show you an example like that. So this is the, this is the uh, what, what's it called, the task bar on the Macintosh? Sorry? The dock, app dock. Um, uh, so the app dock, dock, notice the little dots that show you which applications are active. Many of the people we talk to can't see that, can't see that, that, those dots. Not that it matters much which application is active or not on a Mac anyway, but I don't know why they could feel compelled to even tell us that. Um, and then people uh, who are older are slower on visual search tasks. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and increased sensitivity to visual distractions it occurs in, in some people, not everyone. So visual search. So, so basically, visual search is a, is a kind of a task that cognitive scientists give to people, uh, you know, like uh, find, find the benefits of Amazon Prime membership. Here's a page. And so you, you have to go through and look and see, see what, uh, wh what it is, and then you report the, the answer, and that time is what's uh, the time and success rate is the variable. Um, older people are slower at visual search tasks than younger people. Um, uh, and it's partly because um, there's a, well, there's partly because of the loss of peripheral vision. The, the idea is this, visual search is linear unless the target pops in the periphery. So if I give you a target, this is actually something from my other book, Designing with the Mind in Mind. So the, the phrase is this, visual search is linear unless the target pops in the periphery. So what that means is that if I show you a target, if I tell you to find Waldo, if Waldo is a different color than everything else on the screen, your eyes are going to be able to move there immediately because Waldo's color will pop in the periphery and you, your peripheral vision will be able to spot the color. It won't know what it's seeing, but it will know, your peripheral vision will know that, that the green dot is over there and it will move your, your fovea, the focus of your vision, to that spot and then you'll see Waldo, okay? So, so in that case, the amount of time it takes you to find Waldo does not vary depending on where Waldo is in the, in the display or how many distractors there are. Whereas if Waldo is the same color as all the distractors, that is a linear, linear search task. Because what happens is your eye has to sort of scan the whole page until you come across Waldo, right? So, so vis as I said, lin visual, visual search is linear unless the target pops in the periphery. Problem is that for older adults, fewer targets pop in the periphery. So more visual search tasks are linear, okay? So, so, so that distinguishes two different tasks. If I tell you here, find out how many items are in your cart, that will be instantaneous for just about everyone of any age because people know where the cart is. They know the, to look up here, okay? Everyone knows that. That is to say who, are, who uses Amazon.com. But if I say again, find the benefits of Amazon Prime membership, that is a linear search task, okay? It doesn't pop in the periphery. So the guidelines that kind of emerge from that are things like this, maximize legibility of essential text, 
uh, we say don't use anything less than 14 point, and it also depends on the resolution of the display. The higher the resolution, the higher the point value you need to use. Really what we're going for is on the screen, there should be characters having f a five millimeter extent, okay, regardless of what resolution you're using. Mixed case, static text, ample line of paragraph spacing, plain background, easy and legible text. So, <laughs> so this is an example of the social security site which you would expect more older adults than younger adults to use. And if you want, if you're not satisfied with the size of the text on this site, it's really easy to find out to make the text larger. All you have to do is scroll to the bottom of the page, go to the accessibility link that's hidden down here, <laughs> click on accessibility, get to accessibility help, scroll down the page some more until you get to, I can't see, <laughs> increase text size. I can't see very well, increase text size. And then you increase that and it says, here's how you do it in Internet Explorer. Here's how you do it in, in uh, Firefox, blah, 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 blah. Go to the controls of your browser and change the settings. It's like, no. My Aunt Geraldine is not going to do that. It's much better if you do something like this. Senior help. Resize text. Boom. We made it bigger, okay? Um, use color judiciously. So, um, high contrast, saturated colors draw attention. And uh, unfortunately, mostly they draw it away from whatever it is that you put there on the screen that you want people to see, okay? So, what we say is use color sparingly. Don't, don't blast people out with color. Uh, be cautious with blue versus green because, as I said earlier, uh, some people have trouble distinguishing blue from green because of the yellow tint of their eyes. Uh, make sure colors, users can distinguish colors that convey meaning in your site. So these two might be problematic. Those two pro colors might be problematic for some people. Uh, not for me, but they would be pro problematic for some people. Um, avoid using color as the sole indicator. If, if orange means something on, in your app or website and blue means something else, don't have an orange dot and a blue dot, have an orange dot and a blue, and a blue triangle because that way there's something besides the color that's conveying the same information. Color contrast should be a ratio of 4.5 to 1 or more. Uh, for large text, it doesn't have to be that high. It should be 3, three to 1. So this is a site that doesn't use color ju judiciously. <laughs> Um. <laughs> uh, what? Right. Uh, this is a site that has text on white text on a gray background. Okay, so the contrast is not very high there. I'm sure you can read that, right? Yeah. This one too. There's some th something there. And there's something there. The iPhone. Um, there are some people we know who cannot read the low temperatures. This is the high. That's the low for the day. Some people cannot see that. Or down here at the bottom. This is, I don't know what this is trying to show. What? Oh, all the cities I have indexed. Okay, well, thank you. So um, I consider Bank of the West's homepage to be fairly well designed. Uh, unfortunately, they just changed it last week. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, the w new one's not so bad either. I should get the new one and put it into in here. Um, AMD.org, which is an organization for people who have macular degeneration, what they do is they, first of all, they use large text everywhere and they use high contrast. Um, I, d I wouldn't necessarily use this reverse contrast because of reasons that I won't go into right now, but uh, 
white on dark background is not as good as dark on white background for various reasons. But um, okay, they have big text, so it's, a, it's okay. They can get away with it. But one of the things that they can do is they have this little button up here at the top of the site, which lets you change the contrast so that you can, if, if, if it happens that you have macular degeneracy and then you can't see this very well, you can change it to that by just pushing that button up there. Okay, now we'll talk about motor control. So uh, as we age, uh, some of us, not everybody, gets reduced hand-eye coordination, reduced fine motor control, reduced strength and stamina, slower movements and stiffness. So how many of you are familiar with Fitt's Law? A lot of you, okay, this is a good, good audience for that. Uh, I figured a lot of you would know what it was. Um, so what Fitt's Law says is it, it predicts if I say to you, for the people who don't know, if I say to you, point, your finger is here, I want you to point to that object right there. How fast can you get there? That's what Fitt's Law predicts. And it doesn't matter whether the pointer is a mouse, a trackball, a trackpad, a touch screen, any pointer, even your eyes, okay, will follow this, okay? And so, uh, so what, what, um, or even mouth pointers for people who have, uh, who are quadriplegics, okay? So, so, the only thing we have to change is the parameters of the curve, all right? So, so what Fitt's Law says is, when a motion starts, it starts from zero velocity, it builds up velocity fast to a high velocity, and this period of movement is basically ballistic. When, when you're moving, and I'm trying to hit this target here, what happens is, the brain sends an impulse to the arm muscles and everything, so the arm muscles just go wham, and they start shooting over here, and then as they approach, they slow down and start entering what's called a hand-eye coordination loop until they hit the target, okay? So, so that's what this is. Ballistic first part of the movement, slowing down and slight adjustments until you hit the target, and that's the time to hit. For older adults, what happens is Less of the movement is ballistic and more of it is under hand-eye hand -eye coordination uh, control, all right? So, so the uh, top velocity is not as high and the, uh, uh, so the peak velocity is not as high and the, the uh, hand-eye coordination adjustments start earlier, okay? So that's, that's basically what happens uh, as, you, as you, some people get older, not everybody, like I said. So th what this causes is difficulty grasping and manipulating small objects, stylus or other pointing devices, small controls, difficulty with continuous movements like click and drag, tap and drag, tap and hold, pinch, spread, double tap. So there, there are actually, the, the, the thing I think is interesting about the Macintosh iOS, uh, sorry, not the Macintosh, but, it, but about iOS uh, operating system is that there are certain things you have to do to gain accessibility benefits that are like double tack and, double tack and spread. Dub it's like, I, I can't do that because I can't do it re reliably and repeatably, okay? So, um, uh, so th there's, there's a kind of an irony there of, of putting, putting, you, putting uh, um, accessibility features underneath uh, co coordinated gestures. <laughs> so basically, older adults, some of them are going to have trouble executing coordinated gestures. Uh, and then, as I said earlier, decreased consistency of movement. So basically, just because I can, I can hit the, I can do a click and drag now, doesn't mean I can do one in five seconds from now. Uh, and a greater risk of unintentional click or touch accidental selection of objects, navigation to locations. Actually, one thing that's been happening to me more and more is I'll pick up something and drag it across the screen and drop it into the wrong folder because my hand comes off or something. And it's like, where did it go? I have no idea where it went. Uh, and then, then, of course, luckily in iOS, there's a reverse last action kind of a thing where you can just put it back where it was. Um, there's a test that's done um, 
called a spiral test. So a neurologist will give a person a, say, uh, to a person who has hand tremors uh, or who has just drunk too much coffee, um, <laughs> draw that spiral. And this is, an, this is a spiral that came out of one of those tests. Okay, so here, here's a person um, doing that. So let me just start it. Now I know I have friends who have hand tremors and it's kind of interesting because their hands don't shake when they're just standing like this, but if they try to write with a pen, their, hand, their hands will shake. There's something neurological about that. I don't know, I don't really understand it. Uh, so here's an example. Here's a person trying to select Kenya. This is a website that's designed for older, older travelers the whole the travel industry actually has a, a whole there's a whole segment of the travel industry that's aimed at people with who are older over 50 because they have at least in the developed world those people have money and time so um, so so here's one of those websites and a person is trying to select Kenya from a pull right menu so like I went, when I went up here to you know, to get the country first, you know, I went up here to uh -huh, go to, uh -huh. you know, go up here uh -huh. to, he's bouncing around, a <laughs> Kenya thing here. Okay, so I went in here, oh, come down to Africa. Oh, it's taken me like five times to click on the country. No, of course, none of you have ever had trouble with a pull right menu, is that right? <laughs> it, it turns out there are many ways to fix that problem, okay? Uh, uh, one way, w when we we told that company about that problem, um, uh, what they did was they took the menus which looked like this and they made them fatter. That that slightly alleviates the problem, but it doesn't really solve it. <laughs> it, it actually made it easier, but then now you have to reach down further for for some of these other. Uh, uh, but. You know, there are other ways, which is, which is there are menus that have, I click it on and once I click it, it, until I click again, it stays open. So that's one solution. Another solution that I've seen that's pretty, pretty nifty is that there's a timeout period where I can actually be outside the menu and it doesn't go down. So I can go straight from here to here, like that. So the guidelines that come out of that kind, this, these motor concerns are things like promoting accurate, precise selection of targets, make click targets big. Uh, uh, if a tick, if a click target has graphical parts, those should be included in the target. Uh, swipe targets should be so if you if you want people to swipe across the screen and hit something, tar click, swipe targets have to be larger than tap targets. Uh, put blank space around clickable targets so that people don't hit the wrong one. Uh, place tap targets in the center bottom of the screen so that people don't have to reach all the way across their screen in order to get to, because the further I reach, the less steady my hand is. Um, place horizontal swipe, tar swipe targets near the screen bottom and vertical swipe targets on the right side. This is for right-handers. For left-handers, it'd be the other, the other way. So uh, basically in the book we have guidelines about how big and small cl click targets and tap targets should be. They should be, click targets should be at least 11 millimeters diagonally and uh, tap targets should be 16.5 millimeters diagonally or set 11.7 .7 millimeters square. And this is not, we didn't make these numbers up, they come from the research. So here's a website that has tiny click targets, very hard to hit um, those. This is an app that has nice click targets, not, e not hard to hit those. Uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, if I want to click on banking on the nav bar, I have to click on the word. <laughs> that, that, is not a, that is not a button. It looks like a button or a tab, it's not. I can't click there, it re doesn't respond. I can only click there. Whereas Elder Law, I can click anywhere in that box. 
that's happened. Speech and hearing. So um, some people get slower rate of speech, reduced articulation, comes from like speak, talking to, giving too many talks, for example. Um, hearing, harder to filter out background sounds, localized sounds, understands fast speech, hear low volume sounds, detect high pitch sounds. So there's a little test for you. Okay, so everyone should be able to hear this sound. It's at eight kilohertz. Uh, maybe uh, this is a high pitch sound. So I know I, I've turned it down, I believe, so it shouldn't be too loud. Tell me if it's too loud, and I'll, I'll turn it down for the next one. Just a second. I'm gonna, I lost my cursor. There it is, okay. <laughs> okay, way too loud? Okay, I'll turn it down. So how do I turn the sound down? You turned it down? Okay, good. All right, here's the next one. This is 12 kilohertz. If you're under 50, you might be able to hear this one. I cannot. I cannot hear this one. Who can hear it? Wow, most of you, okay. I, I can sort of hear, I can hear that something's going on, but I can't really hear the sound itself, okay? Too many Steely Dan concerts in my life. This is under, this is, if you're under 20, you can hear this one. If you're over 20, you might not be able to hear it. Raise your hand if you hear it. Okay. So, all right. Um, I can't hear that one at all. I, I, I always have to use younger people to find out if the, my slides are working. <laughs> so, um, the kind of guidelines we talk about in the book are make audible signals in a range most people can hear, use alerts, tones in the 500 to 1,000 hertz range. Um, one of the things we hear from people is, um, my phone is going off, but I don't know where it is. Okay, or, and that happens with sounds that are too high frequency, also with sounds that are too low frequency. So basically, use tones in a certain range. If you go to YouTube and put in hearing frequency tests, you will find a whole bunch of different sites that offer uh, a test where they start at very, very low frequency noises, and you have to put on headphones to do these, and then it runs up through uh, higher and higher frequencies. And what will happen is at you will, you, will no, you will hear nothing for a while, and then you'll start hearing a very low frequency tone and then it will keep going until it's very high and then you won't hear anything anymore. And you can mark where that point is for you. And it will change, I promise you, over time. Um, minimizing background noise is another uh, uh, guideline because uh, the older we get, the harder it is for us to do what's called the cocktail have the cocktail effect. How many of you heard of the cocktail effect? So, so basically, as we get older, it, for many people, not everyone, it becomes difficult to separate that, the sounds of the person you're talking with with the other sounds. I, I find this problem happening in my classrooms, which is kind of annoying, because um, the kids say, well, I just told you. Uh, Another guideline that we, uh, for speech and hearing is to convey in important information in multiple ways. So use captioning, like, you know, this fellow, uh, we, you know, that they've captioned him, which is good because you can, and not only does it help people who are older and might have trouble hearing uh, the sound, but if you're in an airport or, a, or a, uh, a restaurant and, you know, Bernie's on the screen, you can see what he's saying. Um, provide alert signals in multiple forms, provide text to speech. Um, okay, so now what I'll talk about is uh, age-related changes in cognition, attention, learning, and memory. Um, people, what's beeping? Something's beeping. That's you, okay. I, it sounded like it was coming from here, but of course, I'm old, so. Um, reduce 
short-term memory, attention, capacity, uh, difficulty keeping track of a task status. Some people suffer from this, not everybody. Um, uh, some people claim that doing uh, brain games helps uh, stave this off. Um, let, uh, and one of, the, one of the side effects of that is it becomes harder to concentrate on a particular task and stay with that task until you're done. Um, one of the things that's interesting, I, I, I formerly, you know, was a cognitive psychologist, and so for me, think, talking about long-term memory storage and short-term memory is really interesting. One of the things that the research shows is that, you know, older people have a deficit in um, recalling, storing and retrieving new information, but old information that was there, been there for a while, no problem, right? So the question is, why is that? And one of the things that research seems to be pointing at nowadays is that new information, there's some, there's some problem that develops with the storing of metadata with the data. So in order to get to find something, the, the, the brain needs to have sort of associative data, which we, we might as a computer scientist call metadata uh, stored with it. And the metadata doesn't get stored later on in life, uh, or it's messed up metadata. And therefore, the information actually can go in, but it, you can't ever find it, <laughs> OK? So that results in longer learning times and more repetition required. Peop you have, might have to show people who, if in their 80s the, or 90s the, the, the problem, the, 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 how to do this task on the computer five times. Okay, which, you know, that's fine. I mean, you just have to learn that's how you have to do it. Um, less generalization between situations. So a situation that might look the same, this is one of the reasons for uh, that uh, older adults don't like having teenagers helping them with the computer. Because the teenagers say, look, it's just like what I just showed you, Grandpa. And he says, this has nothing to do with what you just showed me, <laughs> right? Um, Reduce ability to multitask, more susceptible to change blindness, more easily overwhelmed. So here's, here's a, oh, so we might need to raise the volume a little bit. This is somebody talking. At this point, I would call them. <laughs> this is so overwhelming. Okay. I would call them and say, help. Okay, so this is somebody trying to book a trip on a uh, online website. And I have to say, this person is somebody who travels the world several times a year and sets up schools and clinics in uh, underdeveloped countries, okay? So this is not someone who's senile in any way, but she did not grow up with this stuff. And basically, when she goes to one of these websites, she just gets overwhelmed. I can't, I can't deal with all this. Here we have an example. So the Road Scholar is another one of those travel websites. Now consider, consider you're, you're using this website and you're trying to book a trip. So here you have your pricing options down at the bottom of the screen. I'm shaking the cursors to get your attention down there. Okay, so, so you look here and you see February 27, 2016 to March 14, 2016. Oh, I don't want to travel then. I want to go on a different date. Well, let me see what other dates are possible. So you pull the menu down, and you change the date to a different date, let's say. And you may not notice that the price changed. It went up by $300 over here, OK? But that, that's because you're looking here. You're looking here, and the price changes over here, right? So that's, that's happening in the periphery, and you're not going to, many people are not going to notice it actually almost regardless of age, but especially for older adults. So cognitive guidelines are like these, designed for conceptual and visual simplicity, minimize stimuli, minimize decoration, uh, help users maintain focus, present one task at a time, eliminate distractions, show the current task. So what you don't want to do is something like this. This is drugstore.com, okay? So it's overwhelming. There's a whole bunch of stuff on the screen. 
you may have had a goal when you went here, but now my goal is completely gone. I have no idea why I came here. The screen is changing. Uh, many of our people in our, in our study found that thought that, um, sorry, let me back up. Thought that if you were, if the picture, the main picture on the page was changing, they were going to a new page. That was their assumption. New picture, I must be on a new page. Why is it moving me to a different page? I didn't click page anywhere. Okay. But, but that's only part of the screen's pro this, this, this page's problems, right? It's just too overwhelming. Whereas DuckDuckGo, one call to action. Android voice recorder, can't get much simpler than that. Kayak, I like kayak. Very simple. Not much in the way of calls to action. There it is. You want to search for flight, there it is. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm going to go through knowledge differences now. So knowledge is the one area where we're going to have to rewrite this book in 10 years. We're going to have to rewrite that chapter in 10 years because knowledge will change. Uh, today's older adults won't have the same. When today's younger adults become older, then their knowledge differences will be different than today's knowledge differences. So, um, so today's adults are unfamiliar with the current crop of technical jargon and icons. They don't know c control gestures, me antiquated mental models based on uh, uh, analog, uh, dig analog uh, electronic technology. Uh, and uh, greater, uh, but they have greater domain knowledge and skills. Okay, so that's the good part. So, uh, you know, please enter a correct value for capture displayed above. They're not going to know what that means. What is a capture? Or even, it gets very subtle. A new update is available. In this version, you will have the option to select between light and dark UI themes from the settings menu. Unemployment insurance? What are you talking about? <laughs> See, the thing is, we've been in this field so long, we forget that we learned that term and that other people don't know it. Icons. So what do you think is the icon for um, uh, a menu, a menu button, an icon for bringing up the menu? Click on this button and a menu will appear. In ways, it's a little pig. I call it a, a, a thought balloon with legs. I don't, I don't really know what that's supposed to be. But that's the menu button in ways. This is the menu button in uh, Android's voicemail app. That's the menu button in Google Translate. Okay, so. First of all, can you at least standardize on a menu button so that I can have a chance of learning what it is? And then second, don't pick a pig. <laughs> um, so uh, I think UPS does a good job of designing their page so that th they're not using foreign vocabulary or tech vocabulary and symbols. Attitude, this is the final category we'll get to. Um, today's older adults are less comfortable with technology and tomorrow's older adults will be less comfortable with, um, you know, the technologies that are coming along. We're, we're now we're saying we're in the digital age. And, we're, and, and like I said, people say, well, everyone will, will know digital eventually when these old people die off. But you know what, the technology next in 25 years isn't going to be digital, it's going to be quantum, right? So, uh, so there'll be a whole new set of vocabulary for people to learn and all of, all of you young people who are growing up in the digital age are going to go, all this quantum stuff, I have no idea what they're talking about. And your kids are going, mom, what's wrong with you? Okay, so, so, but this causes, this causes some, some attitude problems, okay? So older adults today are less comfortable with technology, more risk averse, str 
strongly prefer familiar paths over efficiency, afraid of breaking something, tend to read everything on the screen before acting. So that's one reason why you have to, when you're doing usability tests with older adults, you actually need to give 50% as more time than you would give for younger adults. Tend to, afraid of embarrassment, get frustrated, give up, tendency to assign blame. So here's another example. So at this point, if you were really looking for a trip, what would you do next if we weren't here? What do you think? I would screw this. I would say, you know, if I can't get to what I want in reasonable tries, then this is not, this is, I don't want to go to this company. They lost a customer. So our attitude guidelines would be flexible in how users can enter and save and view data, make data entry fields smart, allow users to save and return to forms, not, don't make me fill it out all at once, and give users a sense of control over input methods. So don't do this. Mobile numbers should be numeric. It is numeric. What are you talking about? Well, no, you can't put those dashes in there. No spaces or dashes in your card number. On my card, it has spaces. Why can't I put it the way it is on my card? How much time will that take a programmer to program? Okay. So here's a, here's a relatively good example. Um, this accepts the phone number in any fo form. So I can put the phone number in any way I want to. It'll accept it in almost any form. I would, if I were designing it, I would say that. They didn't. So, but, it, but it, the nice thing is that you can put it in any way and it'll just convert it to what it needs, okay? Uh, but I, if I were designing that page, I would say include area code any form. Um, inspire trust, re request only information you really need. Make it easy to distinguish content from ads. Otherwise, you're not gonna have trust and if you don't have trust, you're not gonna have customers. So Philippine Airlines, you just wanna sign up for frequent flyer but they want to know my favorite sports. I don't want to tell you what my favorite sports are. So I'm just trying to sign up for your frequent flyer for program. I don't, my leisure activities and act interests, that's none of your business. Um, this is, you know, so you go to this w website, CBS San Francisco, and you read a news story a sad one in this case, and you click on the word family because you think it's gonna tell you about family, but it brings up denim jackets, okay? It's like, that's not going to inspire trust. Yelp does a good job of telling you what is an ad and what isn't an ad. Well, most of the time. <laughs> Sorry? Oh yeah, right. I actually I would change that color. In fact, I would I would make the words the the word ad black and that would lighten this uh that the surround. Um okay, so so uh, you know, an argument we've heard is, well, you know, we have uh, accessibility guidelines already from the W3C and from uh, other sources. Um, from, from Section 508 of the US uh, uh, ADA and from the WCAG, WCAG 2.0. Um, but this is what WCAG 2.0 looks like, okay? So it's pretty complicated and so we don't think that your average web designer is gonna wade through that. Um, so I'm d basically done. I just wanna uh, say that this is what we've covered. Uh, I won't necessarily read this for you, but um, basically these are the topics we cover and th that the book covers. Um, and our people always ask, what are you, how can you boil down your, your recommendations to very uh, short, form, 
this is one way. Um, we urge people to design that way. And I'll be pleased to uh, take your questions. You want to help me ask, answer questions? Okay. No. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm curious what you think about conversational UI and the rise of the Alexas and the, uh, you know, and these other technologies. Do you think that they will help, or is perhaps they're a step too far for, for some? What, what are your thoughts on it? Um, I think conversational is good. Uh, I, I don't know if you've seen the. Uh, there's a YouTube video that was put out by the Saturday Night Live people. Basically, it shows, it shows Alexa for seniors, the S Alexa Silver Edition. Uh, it's, it's, I was actually thinking about showing it to the start of my talk, but then I thought it would make the talk too long, so I, I didn't do it. Uh, but it, just go to, go to YouTube and look for Alexa Silver Edition. It's really funny. Um, but, um, but, so basically what they do in, that, in there is they do things like, uh, you don't have to say Alexa, you can say Elvira or whatever you, whatever you say. Anything reasonably close to Alexa, it'll respond to, um, uh, and, and a bunch of other things. But uh, anyway, to be more serious about your question, um, I think conversational UIs are very promising as long as we can, as we can make them more natural. Uh, what is a I think what's problematic, and this is just my own opinion, okay, I'm not basing this on extensive research or anything, uh, what makes conversational user interfaces difficult for older adults is when they're highly unnatural, Even, and there are a couple of different ways they could be unnatural. One way is they don't sound like people at all, okay, and, and that's kind of interesting because if I've lost Let's say I've lost my, the highs in my hearing. I can't hear consonants as well. And so the consonants in the, in the BART announcement of, of uh, what station, uh, uh, what, which train is coming into the station, it's hard for me to understand what they're saying, okay? That's because the continent, consonants have dropped out. So the, it's hard to sell, tell the difference between t and d and things like that, okay? That's because of the highs. Highs have dropped out. Uh, consonants are harder to distinguish. Uh, but the other uh, difference is uh, poorly designed um, conversational user interfaces are highly restricted in what you can talk about and what kind of vocabulary you can use. But we're getting better, right? It's, getting, it's gotten better in the last five years, tremendously better. Um, and so, uh, but you know, you still see people yelling at their phones saying, no, I said United Airlines flying tomorrow, not today, you know, because it didn't understand what they were saying. So, um, uh, and also the conversational user interfaces will train us, right? They'll train, they're training us to, to speak more clearly and also to, uh, to limit the kinds of things that we say. The use of, the, I, I, when I talk to them, I now use less a, and or the, you know, articles and that sort of thing because it helps the, the computer. I want to help the computer. But, you know, the thing is, people in the older generation are going to have more difficulty making that adjustment. Hi. I had a question about smartphone keyboard inputs. So have you found, like you were just mentioning, larger targets and if it's smaller targets have more gaps, but a keyboard is sort of the classic opposite of that exact guideline. So have you found- Because it has a large target that it has no gap. Is that yeah, what you small mean? small targets, a bunch of them squished together in this little tiny space. So have you found trouble using keyboard, like any any kind of studies that you've done or seen or heard about? Well. Um, I think studies of people using uh, smartphones to text and things like that have, have uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, Kate, um, 
they pretty, pretty clearly show that older adults are slower at that task than the kids who can really, and, can, and I've seen kids, some of my students do it with their thumb. Wham, 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 and they're going so fast, I can't even, I can't even imagine typing that fast on a keyboard with my hands. Uh, uh, I gotta tell you a little bit of an aside. Uh, I did a, I, when I was, before I got the job at Uni University of San Francisco, I was working as a consultant, and one of the, uh, the uh, engagements I had was uh, working for Samsung, doing a study on uh, people's use of smartphones. And we had people across the age range using a bunch of smartphones, and we watched them for six months while they used the smartphones. And for the younger group, this, these, this was a new smartphone that, that Samsung was testing. And um, for the younger group, we actually had to replace the, the, the keyboards a couple of times during the study because they were wearing the, the labels off of the keys uh, from all the texting, whereas the older people, that wasn't a problem at all. <laughs> uh, but I don't know if I, if I answered the question. So, so basically, if, if you're designing keyboards, you know, larger is better, but of course you're space constrained on a, on a smartphone. Um, uh, one, one thing that, that is recommended is if you, can, if you can sort of logically increase the size of certain keys depending on what they've typed up until now, you know, so that, so that the chances, you, you want to increase the chance that if I type, you know, a, uh, a certain letter that the next letter that's more more expected will be have a larger effective size for a couple of fraction of a second or something. I, I've seen that in the literature, uh, so that's one of the things that people that people do. Um, Um, I recently was trying to teach my 80-something-year-old my parents um, how to use their new smartphones. And before that, they'd had the flip phones, which were just so unintuitive that, you know, they did end up off most of the time and not usable. So um, I was stretching my imagination for metaphors in the analog world to help them understand their smartphones. And uh, as well, also using the internet with the browser, what's this and that. And I wonder if you know of any resource of really good metaphors or maybe an infographic that I could show my parents that would in one fell swoop kind of <laughs> explain everything. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe a few. <laughs> um, well, see, there, there, is, there is one metaphor that is uh, pervasive in smartphones, and that is, uh, they, bar they kind of borrowed the desktop metaphor from, from computers because um, you have a screen and on it you put your icons of your apps um, and uh, you know so and you, you drag them around to put them where you want them. Um, we, they don't, on the smartphone they don't tend to call that a desktop because that wouldn't make too much sense. Uh, but there is the trash can you know, so that, you know, that's all, w the, the funny thing is that that's all 1980s stuff, right? That's survived to, in today's smartphones. Um, the, the, the interesting thing we'll to see, well, we'll, what will replace that if, it, it ever, if anything ever, ever does. I'm actually working right now at trying to get the guy who invented desktop icons an award for having done that um, from Kai. Uh, we'll see if that works. Um, uh, I don't know, uh, the guy with the mic. Yeah, thank you. Um, you mentioned the, the 14 point text size uh, as, a, as a general guideline. Um, is that sort of invariant for the display size no. of the screen? Is, is, is it more to do with the, the sort of the particular size, the degree of arc, or is that something that actually also varies with display size as well? Did, did, does the question make sense? Like, you want it to have, say, like 10 degrees of arc for the entire piece For the of character? Text, or does it actually have to be even larger on a larger screen? Is it a function of how big it is on in your eye, or is it a function of the ratio on the screen? Um, the, where the, okay, so we didn't make up these um, numbers that came from 
look, reading lots and lots of literature. And what the literature says is, uh, you know, what really matters is the span on the screen in terms of number of inches or millimeters. And so if, if you have really high resolution screen, tw 12 points is gonna be s smaller than it will be on a lower resolution screen, but it'll have less jaggy, fewer jaggies, right? So, um, uh, so they don't define it in terms of visual angle because usually the angle is gonna be either or the visual distance because it's gonna be this distance with me from my laptop or this distance, which is about the same, okay? They're not talking about uh, interactive television where the screen is over there and I'm sitting on my living room table, okay? Um, I, I've seen interactive uh, television guidelines and there the characters have to be really big. Um, so visual angle does have something to do with it, but it's just that that doesn't get expressed in the literature. I, I, you know, I haven't seen it expressed there. Okay. Is there any other? Qu there yeah. was a question there. Yeah, oh, okay. You're trying to do yeah, left uh, and right. Okay. Um, uh, my question is about consistency. You sh uh, showed a screenshot of a smartphone with the hamburger icon, the three lines uh, for the menu and the three dots. Uh, when do we pick that over the one that you showed that's more? So consistency versus explicit menu word. I, I think that, um, well, I think a lot of users don't think of it in terms of this menu shows is my main menu and this menu shows more, sort of an accessory set of accessories that uh, I wouldn't have to use all the time because the problem is I think designers misuse those symbols and they put things that are essential under the more menu and they put things that are not essential under the men main hamburger menu okay so so it would be and so because of that i think people just generalize and say those are menu, menu symbols and so i think if you're going to uh, standardize on a menu symbol uh, and i'm not going to call it an icon because it isn't one and i can explain that to you in a minute if you, if you want me to in, af afterwards. But um, uh, is, is that if they're gonna standardize, it should be the hamburger menu because it is much more common than the other two. Um, okay, did that answer your question? Is there a finding that really surprised you that you were sort of shocked about? You know, there were some findings that that were surprising. I'm trying to recall some of them right now. And th in fact, there were ones where uh, Kate and I had to go, that can't be right. And so then we'd go back and look at a lot of other uh, documents until we you know, either convinced ourselves that that was right, really, or that um, uh, that, that researcher was like standing, it was an outlier from the, all the other research. Um, can you think of some examples of that? S examples where we were sort of taken aback by what we found in the in the literature. Um, I mean, s some of the things having to do with um, with target size. Uh, I I actually well okay I, I actually was frankly surprised that a that a tap that a tap target can be smaller than a than a, than a, a swipe target. Because I would assume that if my finger's on the screen already, then I can get to a target more easily than if uh, that I'm actually off screen and have to hit the target. So that one was kind of surprising to me. But the literature clearly says that you know, uh, click, uh, swipe targets should be larger than tap targets. Um, um, let's see what what other ones. Um, I'd have to, I know I'm going to have to go back and look at that. Now, now that you've piqued my curiosity, I'm going to probably go home and look that up and try to figure out. Because I know there were some things where, where we were just like, what? No, that's not true. Uh, and and uh, 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 we, we, in fact, found that a couple of things that we thought were not true were not true. Uh, you know, because in fact, one th there was one finding where 
we thought, eh, that seems really weird. It had to do with contrast ratios. I just went to a conference uh, two or three months ago in Vancouver, and I met the guy who wrote that paper, and he said, oh, that was a typo. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you, got, you have to be careful. Yes? Uh, as for the simplicity um, element you mentioned about, uh, what's the proper length of the content? What content will be proper? So, like in the example you showed us, the old lady say, "Oh, I'm gonna screw this because there are so many um, information." So, does it mean that, for example, like uh, when we design some um, like Yelp uh, with uh, like flights? We sh like maybe only show the old people like um, six or ten flight option instead of show them like a hundred. Well, it it depends on how you're doing the showing. Um, uh, I'm a firm believer in a design principle that Ben Schneiderman and his colleagues developed, which is called which goes like this. Overview first, zoom and filter, details on demand. So, so if you have a lot of things to show, abstract away from the showing me the instances and show me something about them so that I can zoom in on the instances if I want to, okay? So, um, uh, so that's, that's one way around the, that, that problem. Um, I don't necessarily think that we want to have uh, computer systems looking through the camera and saying, okay, the person's over 65, so I'm only going to show them 17 items instead of 700. Uh, but I think that uh, I th think that there should be a way to design so that so that so that everyone is satisfied, and, and uh, that might be to um, well, let's see. Okay, so there, 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 are con there are conflicts. For, uh, one of the problems with design guidelines and one of the problems with coming up with this book of design guidelines is that design guidelines always clash, often clash with each other, right? If I do this, I, I'm going against this guideline. If I follow this guideline, I'm going against that guideline. So, you know, Edward Tufte, for example, you know, is all for cramming as much information as you can into a display, right? And so people who follow uh, th some of his design guidelines fill up the displays with, with all, all this detail. But I think part of the problem is that they miss, some of the people who implement Tufty-like displays miss the big picture, which is, yes, but I can step back and blur my eyes and look at a real Edward Tufty display and get the stuff out of it anyway, right? It's, it's abstract in a way that I can see, it, get information even if I'm not looking at the details. And uh, um, uh, too many people just sort of put all the, let's say you're working for uh, uh, Google and you're in charge of the servers farms all over the world. You don't, want, you don't want a picture of all the server farms on your screen. That's too much, right? What you want is, you know, regions. There, I know there's a problem in Eastern Europe, so I can click into Eastern Europe and see get some information about where the problem is in Eastern Europe. Um, I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Maybe we should uh, call it. Just, just a moment, I think you're going to say it. Okay. What do you want to be true in the next five years regarding accessible and universal interface design? Um, well, I want two things. I want companies, more companies, to be interested in designing for an aging population. Um, right now, what you get is, um, you know, well, our customers aren't old, or they don't want to think of themselves as old, or we don't want to, that's too small of a group to, for us to be interested in. Um, the money's not there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, the money is there, and 
the, the, that section of the population is growing larger. And eventually, I think I want businesses to be able to see that, to notice that, and to, to know that it's too much of a market to throw away. The other thing I want is once they know that, and then um, uh, there are there are known guidelines that they should follow, and we've compiled a lot of them, uh, but basically uh, they should go to at least some source, whether it's ours or somebody else's, maybe it's, maybe it's um, uh, W, uh, what is it called, uh, WAAH, uh, the, wor the World Wide Web has a group that's focused on designing for older adults, and they have, they're developing guidelines and have some guidelines follow find some guidelines and follow them right don't just don't just you know have 20 20 year olds designing user interfaces assuming that everyone's like them thank you fair enough thank you And thank you, Kate, for helping and uh, working with so there, uh, Jeff. So you, can look, at, you can look at the book out there on the, on the counter. And if you want to go away with one, reimburse me and I'll let you take one. <laughs>